now we are moving on to Alicia Churchill. Alicia is a poet, author, story writer, and teller. Uh, she's often found reading her funny and moving and honest stories uh, at Speak Up in Lynn that is hosted by Tony Toledo. <coughs> Presently, she's working on her memoir. Is that correct, John? Alicia, yes. Um, Alicia grew up in Hamden, Connecticut, a suburb of New Haven. And she said she spent as much time as she could outdoors there. And when she was indoors, she read a lot. Her family did not fit into the neighborhood that smoothly, she noted. Uh, her house was an antique farmhouse full of books, records, African art, and furry animals. Um, and her father would stay up very late at night blasting mambo and salsa music and typing frantically. Uh, her mother would share Celtic fairy tales. Her father would share African proverbs with the children. Everyone else lived in raised ranches with carefully manicured lawns and American cars on tar driveways, says Alicia. We had falling down picket fence and weed garden and a Peugeot with the doors tied shut with rope. <laughs> Everyone else was a member of St. Rita's Parish. My parents were considered wild pagan hippies. And then her family uh, lived for short periods of time in Africa. And Alicia noted that the kids pointed out that she had dog hair and an inner belly button and that her skin was on inside out. And she got used to being called the weird kid early. In addition to the influence of her childhood experiences and her parents, her travels as a child in Africa and Haiti heavily influenced her writing. And she also notes that her work in diverse, diverse areas such as substance abuse counselor, a realtor, a battered woman's advocate, a middle school art teacher, a bartender, and her current career as a college writing teacher have all helped her to develop a resistance to negativity, a messed up sense of humor, mm -hmm. and a flair for storytelling. And when I asked if there was something people don't typically know about her, Alicia claimed that she is part elf. <laughs> and I will let her share more if she wishes. And I very much look forward to what she has to share with us today. Please help me welcome Alicia Churchill. The first story that I'm going to tell is inspired by the questions that Cheryl asked me uh, before coming here about my influences. And so this is about my father. Um, who is one of the most imaginative, um, extreme people that I know. Um, and this story is called The Party Animal. My father is a man of great imagination. I have to say I may have gotten some of my storytelling hyperbole from him. The thing with my father, though, is that when he says he's going to do something, no matter how fantastical, age inappropriate, celebrity stalkerish, or just plain dangerous, he's no fool in going to do it. He's also not going to get smacked down for hubris the way ordinary mortals do, either. He is going to learn a new martial art as a senior citizen, date a Kennedy, get kicked out of Angola with an AK-47 in his face, or mysteriously master Arabic in one year of law school. You know, the kind of stuff everyone's father does. <laughs> but once in a while, he meets with some frustration. Recently, he decided to use the carrot method to motivate his students to achieve a goal. He wanted them to kick the butts of all the other students at a decent-sized university in a sports challenge. They had not done this in a while, and if they won, a big gold carved cup would be bestowed on them in a ceremony that might look like something from Indiana Jones and the Golden Snitch, if that was a movie. He wanted them to win quite badly. So he made them a solemn promise. If they could just please bring home the glory, he would reward them by throwing a large party with lots of beer and pizza, and just for the fun of it, a real live lion. <laughs> I don't know about undergraduates. They're a funny bunch. They really wanted to meet the lion. <laughs> so they practiced and practiced, and they punched speed bags while playing Eye of the Tiger over and over. <laughs> And they won a lot of different kinds of sport game things. 
They got the cup with their names carved on the side. So my father proudly and happily called up the Barnum and Bailey Circus to rent the lion. Not for the whole day, just for the afternoon. As soon as the exact nature of his inquiry was understood, the circus put on their special concierge of circus animal rentals. This person had a posh accent of a sort that would suit a butler in a 19th century costume drama. But sir, don't you know that a lion is a man-eating carnivore? Lions can be quite unpredictable. In the past, there have been a number of unfortunate incidents. Do you really think this is the appropriate guest for your event? <laughs> Not phased in the least, my father wondered if they had perhaps something similar to a lion, but just a hair smaller and less man-eating, like a <laughs> leopard or a tiger. The devastating truth was then revealed that this, these animals can also get kind of crazy at parties. <laughs> There was also the issue of the cost, $10,000 per hour, for the most elderly, docile, and threadbare of the lions. And that did not include insurance, which might be hard to arrange. <laughs> Many would falter when met with this kind of unimaginative withholding of circus animals from the party environment, but not my father, oh no. Instead, he called up another one of those numbers that we all have in our Rolodex. Right after circus rental, we find fursuit rental. We don't? Of course we do, if we know how to throw a decent party. He rented a couple of very high quality lion costumes. He found a couple of shy but eager to party students, coaxed them into the lion suits, and the party was a smash. <laughs> okay, this next one is called Good Artistic Choice, and it's about a time period when I worked at a very alternative high school, the type of alternative high school that's designed for kids who have been kicked out of the other alternative high schools <laughs> for bad behavior. Um, and this story is really about my philosophy of teaching and how over time a relationship can change. Um, so this is focusing on one particular student. Up a little, okay. On the first day of school, one of the boys succeeded in getting my attention by being arguably the most ill-mannered, aggressive, inconsiderate, and openly threatening person I have ever been challenged to meet in a setting where I must maintain professional boundaries. <laughs> Corey was sturdy and hairy like a large troll. He had a new mohawk, which he'd given himself if the lack of neatness in the back of his head was any clue. The sides of his head were stubby, but he had large, pretty green eyes with long eyelashes. Corey spent the entire first day experimenting with staff tolerance. He sat in my chair, which had wheels, and when I did not immediately stop him, he began to roll the chair rapidly back and forth across the room, bouncing off the walls and hitting other students. <laughs> when I told him to stop, he said, I hope you get into a terrible, fiery car crash on the way home and you die and your children with you. Then he stalked out of the room, surprising me by not slamming the door. By the spring of the second year, I'd gotten to a place where I had a blend of jaded experience and lazy optimism with a hefty dose of significantly lowered expectations that allowed me to consider taking the kids for long walks around the pond, a two-mile loop. I made some requests, that the kids not run in front of traffic and get hit by cars on my watch, that they not light their cigarettes right in front of the elementary school during pickup, and that they stay in their group. In exchange for this freedom to smoke an unlimited amount of cigarettes, the kids would walk for several miles without any serious complaint. On the way back, we stopped at a group of park benches to stare at the ducks and flowers. We shared the narrow path around the pond with joggers and mothers with strollers. I was very straightforward with the kids about the need to not intentionally mortify the passersby. The kids were gracious about this for the most part, unless provoked. <laughs> kids were sprawled all over the metal tables and chairs, smoking, talking, slouching. A woman approached me with her child in tow. The mother had a determined jaw and the child was flinching, but not quite pulling away from her tight grip on his arm. Are you the teacher with these students? She asked me. I knew this would be a good time to pretend not to understand English. <laughs> Perhaps if she thought we were a group of foreign exchange students from a country where public chain smoking was still in vogue, she might let it go, but it was too late. I was nodding agreeably. Yes, I'm the teacher. Yes, these are my students. The kids were all listening, but pretending not to listen as she launched into her lecture. 
My son here is only five years old. The little boy looked at the ground. And he just could not help but notice that these teenagers are making a terrible lifestyle choice by smoking. I'm sure there are many things I could have said to mollify this woman, to make her feel validated, but I couldn't think of any right then. I tried to explain that the kids were all in early recovery from substance abuse and that smoking was really a much healthier lifestyle choice than some of their previous ones. But before I could talk my way out of the swamp or invite her to visit the school, or if nothing else, help a way to help, find a way to help her clearly upset child feel better in this festival of awkwardness, I saw her face contort with horror, and she yanked her child along as she walked very quickly away from me. The little boy was peeking back at me over his shoulder, and he looked both shocked and elated. This was not good. <laughs> I turned around just in time to see the sight that drove her away, and I wish I hadn't. Corey had pulled down his pants while simultaneously yanking up his underwear so that the cheeks of his hairy butt were forced out like a baboon between the tight jeans under and the undies above. The feeling that I had at this exact moment sums up something of my overall confused and conflicted attitude towards my students. I was concerned that we needed to move it, hurry back to school, because certainly this woman would call the police and I needed to start damage control while also running away. I was furious at Corey because I knew for certain that if he was arrested for pulling down his pants, it could result in being registered as a sex offender, and Massachusetts is not relaxed about these things. I was embarrassed, irritated that the woman felt the need to call me out for my student's behavior and that this had unwillingly morphed into my agreement with her that it was not okay. But I knew that Corey was in his ill-thought-out way trying to defend me and our group honor. Maybe this was exactly the wrong way to go about it, but his heart was in the right place. <laughs> a few years later, I ran into Corey at the mall. He was with a group of friends, all boys in black leather and chains, and I wondered if he would duck his head and hide from me, and if he did, I would respect that. But instead, he shouted across the food court, hey, hey guys, that's my art teacher. I wandered over, and he pulled off his jacket to show me his new tattoo. It was a bloody, fang-toothed zombie unicorn. <laughs> Still raw around the edges, the skin shiny. I was gonna get an upside down cross tattooed on my face, he told me. But then I realized not everybody understands Satanism. And some people would have really limited, one-dimensional responses and make me all about this one thing on my face. So I got this instead. I looked more closely at the unicorn. There was a tiny sliver of an upside down cross on his forehead. Good artistic choice, I told him. And he nodded and said, I know, right? <laughs> um, this last one doesn't really have a, a title yet, but I'm just gonna call it the 4th of July. And it's based almost completely truthfully on something that happened when I was in my teens. Um, my parents had been separated for over a year, but to the seasonal gossip mill of my grandparents' summer community, their split was fresh news and the speculative fo fodder of the first big party of the season, the 4th of July cookout with fireworks down at the beach. My grandmother had been making me crazy with her pointed remarks about all of my boyfriends, Jews, Catholics, other unsuitables. So I invited Chip, blonde, tan, pug-nosed and even-featured, skilled at tennis, driving his father's white Mercedes to misdirect her, or perhaps to make a point. Chip had just gotten out of jail in Boston. <laughs> he had taken a bit too much acid and had broken into a pregnant woman's house to grovel on her carpet, worshiping her ankles, knowing she was not just the Virgin Mary, but the transcendent manifestation of all things good and healing and kind. He could not understand why she called the police and was persistent enough in his attempts to clarify his righteousness that he ended up in four-point restraint overnight. But Chip had the calm, refined charm of the unselfconsciously wealthy. He willingly followed my grandmother around her house, admiring her gardens, asking thoughtful questions about perennials versus annuals, and noting the impressive variety of hostas and the monarchs landing on the butterfly bush. He listened attentively as she explained how she single-handedly saved the osprey from extinction. 
But my grandmother was no fool, and she smelled the telltale whiff of crazy on this boy who looked so perfectly suitable, but wasn't. My grandmother sorted my boyfriends with the same quick scan and even quicker toss back reflex that she used to choose vegetables at the farmer's market. Not a keeper was her favorite verdict. <laughs> But the neighbors were not so attuned to the subtleties of sanity, and so we went down to the beach for the annual patriotic boozy picnic. Chip was able to wander with impunity from table to table. In his white izod short sleeve shirt, matching white shorts, and a frayed knotted bracelet around his tan wrist, loafers without socks, he was the quintessential house guest. Nobody demanded to know his pedigree, although who are your people was still considered a perfectly reasonable question. <laughs> Chip made a point on arrival to walk in apart from me. He moved slowly from table to table where each extended family had staked out at least one long area along the sand, paper tablecloths ruffling in the wind, held down firmly with numerous coolers. The lobster, corn, potato salad, and slaw were all provided for the price of admission as was the beer, but the high test premium booze was bring your own and everybody did. Chip sat at each table for a while and without even needing to ask or prompt was able to hear each family's version always told as verifiable fact of my parents' divorce. <laughs> then Chip met me out at the end of the dock after sunset where we smoked and he shared with me all the various versions. My father had met a beautiful black woman out in LA, a daughter of an African king, and he was shamelessly flaunting their love child. My mother, poor soul, couldn't be blamed for her refusal to put up with it. At another table, my mother had run off to Maine with her lesbian lover, a woman she met in her Bible study group. <laughs> In another version, my mother had joined a cult, one that required her to renounce all her worldly goods and take a vow of chastity, as well as silence. Much merriment on this one. How long could Nancy possibly keep her mouth shut? <laughs> At another table, my mother had suddenly realized that my father was a voodoo priest, and she was not going to allow another chicken to be sacrificed in her living room. <laughs> Each of these stories contains some tiny thread of truth, if not actually about my parents, at least about the times they lived in and the risks they faced. But nobody had a remote clue what had actually happened. I was able to finally relax and to take Chip's hand and lead him to my family's table and to enjoy the worried glances this engendered at all the other tables. <laughs> Every year this party ended the same way. The DJ plays I Shot the Sheriff, the teenagers sneak into the unlit bathhouses and come back bright-eyed and wiping their running noses. And my grandmother says something especially mean. <laughs> One of the neighbors, drunk but mostly competent, shoots off the fireworks from down the beach and the cinders and sparks fall down on us, reflecting impressively off the ocean and sometimes burning hair or skin just a little. And every year, someone has to mention the epic scene in the late 1960s when neighbors from the perfectly safe and clean but merely upper middle class beach community on the other side of the point snuck across the invisible line and sat on the hill above the beach on private property and left beer cans and other unspeakable things in their wake. I always asked, what's so bad about that? Why shouldn't they see the fireworks? And somebody always patiently explains to me that I missed the point. What could have happened if they had broken into the houses, if they had taken silverware? <laughs> in my mind, I imagine what could have happened. I see Vikings landing in ships, setting fire to the bathhouses, and picking up the lovely young au pairs, and carrying them shrieking away over their shoulders. I see the captains of industry, barrel-chested important men in the conference rooms of Manhattan, pushed out of the way and left waving their arms in frustration at the sky as the Vikings leave with all the picnic food and the beer. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much. Everything is 
is all right Can't help but believing And knowing that it's true Everything is better Now that I'm loving you When I kiss you In soft starlight I can't help but knowing Our love is very right Can't help but believing And knowing that it's true Everything is better Now that I'm loving you When I look in your eyes And see how they glow I can't help but feeling Our love's going to grow Can't help but believing And knowing that it's true Everything is better Now that I'm loving you Everything People than me ride their bikes when it's cold. They own the appropriate gear. They acquired it last summer before the fall weather was here. Better people than me grow their own mint. They start it from seeds before even a hint of the summer weather. Then when it's hot they can garnish a julep or green tea lemonade. With jagged green leaves, they can claim to have made. Better people than me know when to say when. They're ahead of the curve. They rise with the tide. They walk in the sunlight. They have nothing to hide. They hold fast to their dreams. They cleave to the truth. And they pick the right lane at every toll booth. <laughs> Garbage day. A week's worth of used up stuff, excesses and small depravities, gathered, bagged, and crushed, all going to the dump. Men in dayglow vests and clumsy gloves hoist my mess into the yawning mouth where it is chewed with neighbors' secrets into one anonymous lump. I sigh my relief in knowing that what rotted last week is gone, like a love letter when you burn it. But I get an unpleasant catch in my chest when the truck beeps in reverse. Oh God, they can't return it. <laughs> Dancing in the dark. I woke up with an involuntary jerk. You know, one of those hiccups in your sleep left over from nights when lions and cavemen, so much goes on in the dark. In retreat from the day, you curl into a knot and shrink down to a ball of essentials. Next move, you stretch one leg long with toe on point, the other bent, poised like an Egyptian, dancing, painted on the wall of a tomb. Car lights scan the window shade and you wonder, who is cruising the neighborhood at this time of night? The hours 
conspire with your anxieties. You rearrange the sheets and try laying on the other side, embracing the pillow for comfort, smoothing the covers to ease your mind, concentrating on peace, drifting off, until ancient instinct jogs muscle memory and you wake up with an involuntary jerk. Thanks. This week I was reminded, from dust we came to dust we shall return. But what about the dust in life that every day we spurn? Dust is here, dust is there, dust is one thing that we all share. For many years I fussed and fussed, just hating to have to wipe off the dust. I realize now, before it's too late, dust is really wonderful. In fact, it's just great. <laughs> it reminds me I'm alive. And every day is such a gift. Now, every time I see some dust, I get a great big lift. <laughs> That's it. Thank you.